Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest is no stranger to the show. He is possibly the most knowledgeable investigative reporter when it comes to all things cartel. What they're up to, how they're doing it, and everything in between. In fact, this will be his third appearance on the show. This guy is two years ahead of mainstream media. In fact, his first visit on the show, which was over two years ago, he broke the story that China was aiding cartels in the fentanyl crisis that we're seeing here in the U.S. today. He talked about how the cartel is sending in chemists to train the cartels and how the Chinese are sending all the supplies and chemicals that they need to make the world's most potent fentanyl. Now, two years later, you see this in mainstream media, you see it in presidential campaigns, everybody's talking about it. Hate to break it to you, that's old news. Now he comes back and he tells us that the cartels are starting to move out of the drug trade and into completely legitimate businesses. That's right, they're growing and they're getting stronger and they're turning legitimate. Big problem, major problem. Ladies and gentlemen, if you get anything out of this show, please head over to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, leave us a review, tell us how we're doing, like, comment, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, and I see you all out there making content, using our reels. In case you didn't know, we have a link below. It has thousands of raw cut reels waiting for you to download them for free, put them on your channel. Make channels, put them on IG, TikTok, YouTube, wherever you want. Monetize them, make money. All we ask is that you tag the Sean Ryan Show. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Luis Chaparro to the Sean Ryan Show. Luis Chaparro, welcome back. Thanks, man. For for, for the third time in... In the show, I really appreciate it. Repeat offender, third, <laughs> third time. I don't think anybody's been on here three times. I, I don't know, man. <laughs> You're the first one, but man, we, you always have cutting edge information on the cartels and what they're up to, and you know, watching the news cycle. We've known each other for what about two years, maybe a little bit Probably over more. two years, mm -hmm. and it's interesting because. The stuff that you were talking about on this show two years ago is just now hitting mainstream media. Mm -hmm. You know, you were the one, to my knowledge, I've never heard this stuff anywhere else. You were the one that broke the story about how China is sending in the chemists to train cartels how to make the world's deadliest, uh, most potent fentanyl. You were the one that broke the story that they that that China is sending in all the supplies. Yeah to make the world's most potent fentanyl. And just now I'm starting to see, I mean, I'm interviewing a lot of politicians because uh, election season's coming up and I'm seeing, I am just now seeing politicians mm -hmm. start to talk about this stuff. I'm just now starting to see mainstream media talk about how China is involved with this whole fentanyl crisis. Yeah. And I'm sitting here watching this and I'm like, man, we. We broke this over over two years ago at this yeah. point. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's always a good thing that they're actually talking about it, but uh, I think they have a delay, right? Two years delay. On, it's on totally months. outdated at yeah. this point. Yeah. I mean, and we're going to dive into that um, because I've been hearing that cartels are starting to, I don't know if moving away from the drug business is the correct term, but or sentence, but it sounds like they're trying to legitimize their businesses mm -hmm. and, and kind of move away from from the drug business. But, um, so I wanna dive into that, but, <clears throat> but I, that's a compliment. I just wanna say, I mean, what, I mean, what do you think? When you look at the news and you're like, I've been talking about this stuff for two years now. You guys are just picking this up. I mean, it's all—it it makes me almost seem hopeless because it's. Yeah, they're like honestly, they're I'm so far behind the problem. I'm 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 very used to it right now at this point, you know, because um, I remember that time I told you that a lot of people believe that was a conspiracy theory, 
and they were holding me holding me up for that like that that sounds like conspiracy a lot of these uh, media outlets wouldn't take those stories people for calling you a conspiracy theorist yeah well they, they like, you had hold on let me let me make a correction last time you came down here just to prove that you were in the fentanyl labs you brought in video footage of cartel chemists wearing Vigilance Elite hats. <laughs> yes. So I don't know how anybody, I mean, and AI wasn't even a thing back then. No, <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, they, they <clears throat> I guess when I try to pitch some of these stories to mainstream media back then, there was like a bit of like reluctancy, you know, like I was faced with these sons sort of like anti-China general feeling, sort of like racism, conspiracy theory. And I was like, dude, I'm not going against Chinese people. I'm just telling you what I've learned from on the ground in Sinaloa. I wasn't really publishing most of those stories back then because of that, because they, they, they thought that there was not enough evidence, you know, like a cartel source or me embedding with them and stuff that was probably not enough. Um, eventually, it's getting into the mainstream media. Now everybody wants that story, right? Right mm -hmm. now everyone is like, dude. And I'm like, dude, there is a lot of new things happening. You yeah. know, like, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I feel kind of that I'm getting used to it. Used to, used to feel that the mainstream media politicians are always behind of what is happening in the streets. My job is to report this stuff timely and correctly and in an ethical way. Um, and if they don't want to take it, if they want to pick it up, uh, I mean, it's on them. It's already proven that this is happening. And this is why I'm trusting shows like yours, specifically your show, right? Uh, saying like, this guy opened up his cameras and microphones to listen to, to proofs, you know, not to listen to a conspiracy, not to listen to me thinking or, you know, overthinking things. Yeah. Send you videos, send you photos, my reporting, and, and, and now it's coming up. And it, and I'm glad it's coming up, you know, to the, to the news and, and to the politicians. But now there's a lot of new things happening on development. Yeah, we're going to get into if that, I mean, we're going to get into the, if that story is even relevant at this point. I mean, that, it sounds like things have developed so so much yeah. that uh, maybe this stuff isn't even relevant. There's another thing at dinner last night. I learned something interesting about you. So I don't want to make light of it. it we we're laughing about it, but uh, you have a sixty thousand dollar bounty on your head. Yeah. Why yeah. do you have a sixty thousand dollar bounty on your head? And this is who's the thing. Put it on there. I I honestly don't know. I'm not sure who put it out. Uh, a source reached out to me, a source within the federal, a, a federal agency uh, here in the US. US federal agency. US federal agency. Um, he's been my source for, for several years, and he sent me a photo of a post they got a handoff. They didn't share any more details, like where did I, they find that or how or whatever. Probably on the phone or, or something, on any device of one of these guys they arrested recently or something. But um, but on that on that image that was my photo like from from socials uh, one of the oldest photos i have on instagram or something and he was asking for help from his guys from his people right like hey guys um here is sixty thousand for the head of this um that are alive um and <laughs> i was like wow 60 grand it's 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 you know it's good money. I was I was a bit you know blushed, but, but yeah, was like, I'm not gonna lie, Luis. I could use an extra sixty G's. <laughs> Me right too, now. dude. I told my wife, and she's like, "What if we?" You know, <laughs> it's it's not it's not bad money. I, I, this is the thing. I don't know how real that is. I don't know um, if it's really the Sinaloa cartel or a faction, at least, of the Sinaloa cartel that put that out. I don't know if it's a you know, online troll or whatever, but that was apparently not a share online to make like fun or make a joke. That was retrieved from a device on one of these guys, uh, as per my source. That's what that's what I said. Oh wow! I asked him if this was serious. I was like, Do you, "How serious is this shit?" And he's like, "Dude, any any threat, you should take it as as being serious." You know, because um, I get a lot of threats all the time. Do Mo you really? Most of the times is it's just like copycats, trolls, you know, people that they, we call them cartel fanboys, you know, it's, it's people that they don't even know oh. anything, but they just 
are big fans of they're El pretending, Chapo, you know. So they're pretending, and they thought they're like, "Shut the f- up, man! Don't ever publish that shit again, or we'll, we'll kill you." And, and and then you do a little bit of research, and you know, it's like, ah, dude, come on, you're just a cartel fanboy. Yeah. Um, what, I, what is the what? I mean, what's the cartel think of cartel fanboys? Do they? they I mean, if somebody's putting a bounty, because it sounds like. The Sinaloa cartel is actually a big fan of you. Well, sort of. Certain factions, I guess, and at certain points and in certain moments, you know, I do know that they got pretty pissed, uh, uh, you know, of the last time I was there because I broke inside the son of El Chapo's house hours before he was extracted and arrested. You broke into the son of El Chapo's house. Yeah, dude, and it was it was absolutely crazy, dude. Of course like, you it was, did. It was, it was, <laughs> How did you break into his house? Is it somebody sitting on it? No, so this is the thing. The, that morning, I can't remember the, it was January, I think, this January. That morning, I, I started getting a lot of messages uh, on my phone. I usually put my phone in silent mode, uh, only a couple of secure apps I use to communicate with sources, that, that, that those are always on. So I started like getting a bunch of like bzz, bzz, like five in the morning. And I read it and, and they said like, hey, there's a lot of things going on in Culiacan right now. Culiacan is crazy. There's a lot of like uh, narco blockades. So they were like setting up trucks and vehicles to block roads around Culiacan and setting them on fire. And I was getting all those reports and I was like, yeah, they're probably doing an operation against someone big. Never thought that we're going against one full chapel of sons, you know, until one of these messages said, apparently the operation is in Jesus Maria. And I knew that Jesus Maria is the town where Ovidio Guzman was hiding. He has a, a ranch, beautiful house, state of the art property in this very poor, impoverished um, ranch outside Culiacan, like 40 minutes drive outside the main city in Sinaloa. So, when I read Jesus Maria, I was like, shit, they're after him. This is happening. They're going to get him. Woke up, first tweeted, you know, <laughs> put it on my Instagram. I think this is happening. And start recording on my on my, on my my cell phone. Like, hey, guys, I'm hearing reports that this is happening. Uh, Pitch advice. Uh, hey, guys, I think this is, this is happening. I probably should be getting my ass there. I'm going to pay for my whole trips. Uh, but I want to pitch this story to you because I like publishing that story there for them. Um, they said, yes, let's put together a legal team, a security th- thing going. Uh, but by the time they did that, I was already, you know, booking my, I, I booked three different flights because I know they have people in the airport. So they will know if I'm coming. They will see the, the list of names of people deplaning. Um, so I booked three different flights in and out. Uh, round flights, three different hotels on three different nights. Uh, the uh, security team from from Vice asked me not to be more than not to spend more than ten hours on the ground and be out at the same day. So I was I was thinking of that, right? I was like, I'm just gonna get there. I didn't reach out to any source beforehand because I was like, no, do it. If they know that I'm there while they're still, you know, that was very recent. That that was happening that morning. By 10 in the morning, I was already having the confirmed information that Ovidio was arrested and he was taken into a uh, hangar in Mexico City. But people were still fighting by 10 in the morning in Sinaloa. My f- I, I, I left home. My flight left at like noon. So so when I landed, it was still going on. You know, it, it, the, 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 the infight was still going on when I landed in Mexico City. And then I flew the next day, early morning, to, to Culiacan. I arrived in the first flight, like five, six in the morning. And as I arrived there, I reached out to my sources. I was like, hey, dude, I have a strong source in the Sinaloa cartel in Culiacan. And I told him, hey, dude, um, um, I'm, I'm in Culiacan, I'm in your town, and I probably need a couple of, of you know hands, extra hands to help me out getting there to Jesus Maria. And he said, what the are you doing here, man? You're going to get you and me killed because shit, it's just hitting the fan. I had previously had a ban by the Sinaloa cartel from going to, to Sinaloa because of a story I did inside uh, weed, uh, let's call them laboratories, where, where they're manufacturing weed products and stuff and, and setting up dispensaries in Sinaloa. Um, so they already asked me, don't ever come back to Sinaloa. 
And there I was again a couple of weeks later. This just happened like three weeks later after I was banned from Sinaloa. So I called this guy and he's like, dude, you shouldn't even be here, man. And I was like, I know, dude, but I don't have anything, anyone else to call. And he's like, just uh, stay there where you are. I'm going to pick you up in a different car. The unthinkable is happening. No more surprises. It's all out in the open. Our so-called trusted institutions tell you, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. But you know better, and you won't allow yourself to be blindsided again. Join the folks investing in emergency food storage. You can trust My Patriot Supply, the nation's largest emergency preparedness company. Pick up their best-selling three-month emergency food kit with breakfasts, lunches, and dinners that last up to 25 years. Their delicious meals offer over 2,000 calories every day. Just add water, heat, and then eat. Go to preparewithshawn.com and get yourself a three-month emergency food kit from My Patriot Supply for each family member in your family. My Patriot Supply also sells biomass stoves, off-grid room heaters for power outages, gravity-powered water filters, heirloom seeds, and survival gear that may come in handy soon. Visit preparewithshawn.com and get ready for the fallout. Once again, that's preparewithshawn.com. I've spent more time than I would like to admit researching, testing, trying to find the perfect mattress that's going to give me a good night's sleep. And it basically got to the point where I just gave up. I suffer from chronic back pain. It comes from 14 years of combat operations as a Navy SEAL and a CIA contractor. My back's just shot. No matter what mattress I use, it, I wake up, I can't move, it takes me about 45 minutes just to loosen up to bend over to put my shoes on to get out the door. And then somebody, a friend of mine, told me about Helix mattresses. So I went to the website, turns out they got a quiz you take, you take the quiz, and then they make a recommendation out of the 20 mattresses they have in stock. Mine was the Midnight Lux and Bam, had it shipped right to my house. Very skeptical, by the way, but slept on it first night. Slept like a baby. Complete game changer. Another thing I like about Helix mattresses is they have the enhanced cooling feature that keeps you from overheating. We've all used mattresses where you wake up, especially these memory foam ones, right? You wake up and you're sweating. And you can't go back to sleep. Well, Helix is taking care of that. Take the Helix Sleep Quiz at helixsleep.com and find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash SRS and use the code HELIXPARTNER20. This is their best offer yet, and it's not going to last long. With Helix, better sleep starts now. Picked me up, took me to the hotel. I called a photographer, a local photographer. I said, like, hey, dude, you want to join with me? I need photos, I need video, and I'm doing this shit. I understand if you feel sketched out, but I'm doing it. And he's like, yes, let's do it, man. <laughs> Go Damn. with you. Brave dude. And, and, and we went up to Jesus Maria. Of course, all the way uh, uh, up to Jesus Maria, there were still, like, burnt trucks, burnt buses, like hand grenades all over. It was a f-ing war zone up there. And as we got to Jesus Maria, there was a checkpoint from from the Sinaloa cartel henchmen, a lot of sicarios and motorcycles driving around the arc, arcs that said, welcome to Jesus Maria. Do you have footage of this? Yes, all of this stuff, it's uh, it's on it's on my, in my channel. If you, if you, I did like a short documentary, like I recorded everything as I arrived into the city as they drop up all the way there. Um, so we went in and we started approaching Ovidio Guzman's house. And as we approached, I watched this, this woman and a bunch of suited guys. And my photographer said like, oh, it's the Fiscalia, the uh, general attorney's office, so we're good. There's government. And I'm like, okay, so we're safe. Jumped out of the car with my camera in hand, in hand, and then this woman starts saying, no, 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 no. And then these dudes jump at me. And then he's like, oh, shit, this is not government. And it turns out it was uh, Ovidio Guzman's mom. 
a uh, former wife of El Chapo, who's also has she also has a five million dollars uh, bounty uh, by the U.S. government for being involved in the, the Sinaloa cartel. So she immediately starts t- telling me like, no, 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 just get the fuck away. And I'm I'm not recording. I don't have my camera on. I just want to talk to you and probably go inside Ovidio's house. And she's like, no, just get the fuck away from here. And these dudes tell me told me like, just get the fuck away. If you want to interview neighbors, that's fine by us. Don't come over to these property. Well, good. So I went, did a bunch of interviews around with the neighbors. They absolutely loved the video, loved the Guzmans. Uh, old people, you know, old sick people <clears throat> saying that video. And the Guzman's family has always helped them out with, with medicines, with money, with whatever they with whatever they, they needed, right? But again, if you look at their homes, very, very poor people you know really poor people man with without anything without a car without you know like old uh washing machines not food on their fridges <clears throat> absolutely poor no i wouldn't property. expect this guy to live in a neighborhood like that uh, it, it was one of his one of his properties outside the city you know where he okay. was hiding the thing was he was hiding there because he couldn't celebrate christmas or new year's eve with his family because he knew he was being sought out after so he waited until all that went through a couple of days into January, and then he brought over his daughters, his wife, and a couple of friends to have a family party on that property. And so when they got him, he was asleep. He, he got a bit drunk the lot last night, stayed up until late. So these guys just, boom, let's do it right now while he's asleep. Um, so I interviewed the neighbors, and I noticed that his family and the attorneys left the property. And I was like, this, this is probably a good time. It's now or never, you know, I, I need to go in. I need to see what happened inside his house, how he was living. Um, I need to just go inside his house. I told the photographer, I'm going in. And he's like, dude, if you spend more than five, five minutes in there, we're leaving. We're taking off. We're leaving you there. <clears throat> There's people around circling Sicarios henchmen. And we're just making it look as if we're, we're taking photos from outside. But even from outside, dude. Bullets everywhere, unexploded grenades. It was it was blood everywhere. Wow. Um, so I found a hole on the on the wall, <laughs> on the on the wire he had on, on the wall, and I literally jumped over the fucking hole inside his house and started recording. I had my phone in a in a GoPro, um, and I started recording everything inside. And inside was war zone, war zone, like heavy, like fifty calls all over. Blood all over, man. You, I, I was like stepping in sticky blood all over. Uh, no kidding. Yeah, dude. Like, and you, you have footage of this? I have footage of that shit, man. It's, Can we put it in? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll, send, I'll, send, I'll send you the, the footage. It's, it's crazy stuff. And then I went into his daughter's room's room, uh, completely like soaked in blood. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't think it was from them. It was from his henchmen that tried to hide inside the house when, where they were still fighting the government. Um, but yeah, man, it was it was very contrasting because you will have a setting of a family party, right? Wine bottles, expensive wine bottles, um, dinner table uh, plates, a um, cómo se llama? A, what we call a nacimiento in, in, in nacimiento in, in Spanish, which is baby Jesus and the whole. Mm. Uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, like a nativity scene. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. They they had that in the party of the backyard, uh, but at the same time, everything was like riddled with bullet holes and wow. blood and unexploded grenades, fifty calls. And his closet, he had a bunch of Rolex uh, boxes o- open. The Mexican military stole everything he owned, man. Everything, it's expensive shoes, expensive shirts. Tennis shoes, um, the Rolex, uh, Hubble watches he had there, jewelry. Um, it was all empty. And, wow. and I asked the neighbors, and they're like, we watch how the Mexican government was putting everything on pillow uh, uh, sleeves and taking it all, all out. They took everything. So, so I record the whole thing. And I was, uh, as what I was coming out, I remember finding a a hole. This it was a tunnel disguised as a um, as a water uh, system, you know. 
uh, but the boss, it was a tunnel. And then I asked my guy, like, hey, can I go out now? And he's like, no, 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 just like stay there. You can hear in the video I, I shot, my fucking heart was racing, man, because these guys were right outside when I was trying to get out and I could hear the motorcycle circling. Government or cartel? The cartel guys. And I was like, if they find me inside this place, they're not gonna shoot me, they're not gonna kill me. They're gonna call the authorities, they're gonna put me in jail, and they're gonna torture me for several years in a Sinaloan oh, jail. Man. Um, so I was like, um, stay, hidden for a couple of minutes until this guy told me it's now man you you need to get out now we're leaving so i went again through the hole uh i was so nervous that i fell back on my on my back i was like uh then i handed over the camera so like dude just leave i'll i'll get out i I managed to go out i immediately switched the uh the the footage the the uh card card. to sim cards and everything uh and as we were getting out uh, we got stopped by, by by the checkpoint of these guys, and they just literally asked me like, "Everything good?" And I'm like, "All good." And he's like, "You're done?" And I'm like, "All done." And they're like, "Okay, be safe." And I'm like, "Thanks." And off we went. They put a guy to follow us until probably they were expecting us to go outside the town, and then he'll just get back. On our way out, I, I was still like kind of shaking with adrenaline, and and you know, I was still like, "Shit, man." Um, I can't believe I have this footage. I can't believe I have this story, and these guys are still following us. Uh, and I need and I need to catch my. Phone. Two of my play, two of my flights were already left, so I had one left. But by five p.m., and it was already like three or some shit like that. And we're driving out, and then the fucking car breaks, like in the middle of a nowhere highway, with these henchmen following us. And I was like my life dude uh, um i was like what happened and then this dude was like i don't know man it overheated so i went to a corner store got, got some water and gatorades and pour the fucking gatorades on, on the radiator it's like oh, oh, shit. we just need to get out of here man yeah. i'm sorry for your car um we managed to leave lost my flight so i so i had to go into one of the hotels i had uh, booked went to that hotel turns out the attorneys and Ovidio's mom were staying in that hotel that night. So I was like, I still had like somewhat long hair. I put a hoodie over, went into my room, bus caught my fucking head off and left everything ready to go. You know, I, I was just literally just waiting for my next flight uh, the next morning. How did you know that the, who, his attorney and who? Uh, his his mother? mother and his mom, yeah. Because I, I watched them on the on the restaurant. As you enter the hotel, there's a lobby and there's a restaurant. And they were sitting at, at that restaurant, you know. So I watched them. I was like, oh, they're, they're here. So I just literally went for for the um, elevator, put a hoodie on. I remember recording on my phone like, oh, shit, these guys are here. Uh, it's, I mean, I'm just getting ready to leave tomorrow. I can't wait, you know. Then this morning I left like 5 in the morning. Stay a couple of hours in the, in the airport. The two longest hours of my life Not at the Kulekan airport. I was like, I need to leave. Um, and, and I left. So those two things made these guys, or at least one faction of these guys, not happy ab- about my work, right? When I mm-hmm. posted this shit, went viral, went everywhere. And they were like, mm, this mother f- broke in Ovidio's house. He recorded everything. Which, if I'm being honest, I'll think like, dude, you probably can prove a case. You you got stolen by the Mexican government. They f- shot at your whole place, not giving any f- about your daughters being here and your wife. You know, mm-hmm. could probably use that. Yeah. But uh, but I but I but I know they they got they got mad at me because of that shit. I mean, does that bother you? What is when 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 you have a an insider of the federal government on the U.S. side saying, hey, I just want you to know you got a $60,000 bounty on your head. We just recovered this off a device. What, I mean. It, it worries me, man. Absolutely. It worries me because of my family, uh, for for their safety, safety and for my own as well. I want I want to leave until, you know, I die from, from age and yeah. to see my kid grow old and shit. Um, it worries me, but at the same time, it's like, what am I going to do, man? What am I going to do? Like, if they ask me to stop doing what I do 
forever. And they tell me, you know what, you need to stop forever. Uh, and I have enough reasons to believe that is true. I'll, I'll probably think about it. But up until today, I've never been asked to stop. I uh, to stop. I've just been asked to nothing. Just get empty threats, you know. Yeah. Probably because they're furious, because they're, you know, coked up, they're drunk, and they're impulsive people. Most of these guys. This is this is the another thing that kind of like gets me into thinking that the, the understanding that these threats are real, but at the same time. There is a lot of things playing out, right? When when you ask me about how these cartel guys feel about cartel fanboys, they absolutely fucking hate them because they bring a lot of heat to them. Mm-hmm. What what would you think it would happen if I reach out to both governments and say and make a presser and bring in NGOs protecting journalists and, and shit and say like the Sinaloa cartel put a sixty thousand grand bounty on my head and I need protection. And I need help from you guys. And I need, you know, and I start making a whole a fucking mess and, and a big thing out of it. Um, you know, pitching stories about that to every other media outlet. This is just going to bring more heat to them. And I know for a fact they don't want that. So they will go after the guy who probably, without permission, put up, put up a, a hit on my head. They will probably go after that guy. So, like, dude, just leave him alone just stop that shit now yeah we don't need the heat right now especially when we already have both of our governments after us right mm-hmm. because of the fentanyl and all that shit and what happened to a video so so they just want to be clear from all that shit and i don't i don't mean to cause any more trouble for, for the, what i have right so so yeah I, I i know that um this this uh, another another time real uh, quick yeah. before we move on I just, you broke into Ovidio's house. Ovidio's house. I just want everybody to know who exactly that is. Yeah, absolutely. Ovidio Guzman is the youngest son of El Chapo. He's one of the three leaders of the what we call Los Chapitos, which is the main faction of the Sinaloa cartel. Um, this dude is, uh, uh, I think Ovidio is about 32, 33 uh, years old now. And he was arrested in 2019 in Culiacán, and it whole hell broke loose in Culiacán, on what we call Culiacanazo. Hundreds and hundreds of henchmen went out the city, started fighting the government. Um, they they grabbed the families of the military members involved. Uh, there is a military base in, in Culiacán. They grabbed the families, locked them up on their houses, on the military base, and set a lot of explosives around and, and with gasoline and shit. And they threatened the government, uh, to say, if you don't release a video, we're going to kill all these families. They opened a hole on the prison, on the main state prison in Culiacán, to let a lot of, a lot of Sinaloa cartel members in jail out, armed all the and ask him just shoot around the city everywhere and everyone. So imagine a city of less than probably less than three hundred thousand people, absolutely taken by probably a hundred thousand you know armed people around. It was it was a mess. So the Mexican government had to release a video um, from their from their custody, and that that was embarrassing for the government, of course, and that was empowering. For the for the Sinaloa cartel, the Chapitos faction at least. Yeah. So Vidio Guzman was in the center of that stuff, uh, of of that detention, and then he was freed. He lived free for two more years, probably two, four more years. That happened in 2019, and he was arrested early in January this year. He was just extradited last month to the U.S., and he's currently in uh, Chicago MCC, probably facing life. Wow. Yeah. And you broke into his house. And I broke into his house. Man, that's <laughs> crazy. No, I got to be honest, you know, hearing some of the stuff you did for your trade craft, I'm impressed. <laughs> You've, uh, I, you weren't doing that stuff the first time I talked to you. I mean, you booked three different flights, mm-hmm. booked three different hotels, yeah. took the SIM card out of the camera. I mean, most people aren't that heads up. Yeah, no, dude, I've been, I've been, I've been trying to step up in terms of taking care of myself and not being so reckless. I mean, it is reckless enough to... Literally, literally go and do that shit. Yeah. But I was like, nah, I can't be that, f- you know, careless. Yeah. I need to, I need, and, 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 and this, that's the other thing. I, I want to keep covering this kind of like beat 
cartels and criminal organizations probably just going to do like big stories and stop doing a bunch of little small stories that are gonna get me in trouble, you know. Um, so 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 yeah, I, that that was that's probably related to that. That was probably that that threat was probably related to that. Probably I think probably I don't want to say it is related to that. Or and again, a, a fun boy, boy who you know got angry because I broke into his fan dude whatever or video. Yeah, you know, I mean, talking to you last night, it seemed. I mean, I asked you this question last night at dinner, and I, you know, and and you told me about that, and I was like, man, I'm, I'm, last time we spoke, it sounded like everybody within the Sinaloa cartel is. I mean, it sounds like they love you, you know, <laughs> sort and of. Uh, and I even get, I'm not gonna lie, like I get a little nervous, you know. I've yeah. I've been trying to get you back on here for a while, and I'm like, Luis. What's going on? Why aren't you coming back? I see you going on these other podcasts. Come on. <laughs> and then I got where I was like, maybe we went a little too in depth the last time and he got in trouble. But um, no, now you know for a fact that they actually love your show too, man. Like they're, they're watching, they're watching your show. They like your show. They enjoy, you know, your, your guests and, and your show in, in general. I think these guys, I don't know. I don't know if they love me or they hate me. I guess maybe it's a little of both. What I've been told by, by, by one of the higher-ups in the Sinaloa cartel is something very straightforward, which makes sense. He's like, dude, you talk a lot of bullshit, but you seldom tell a lie. What we respect is a journalist who probably comes after us and, 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 and tries to expose what we're doing and our operation and that shit. That's fine. That's your game. This is our game. You're not the first one, you know, the authorities, the governments are after us, so we, we know how to take care of us. But if you, if you tell lies and you're getting paid by telling lies, that's going to get you killed. That's going to get you hated by us. They know that I don't tell lies, not purposely at least, you know. I know that he, he's, he, he called me out on a couple of things, you know. He's like, when you said this and when you said that, that's absolutely not true. But, but he could tell that that was not true, not because I wanted to put out a lie. I had just wrong information as every other journalist, right? Probably bad sourcing, um, yeah. and that was it. But it's it's never my intention to intentionally put out lies for the sake of whatever, money, cloud, whatever. You know, it's uh, I'm trying to be responsible as of my information, confirmed, different sources. If I can, go there, be there, see it for myself. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I mean, it. you're essentially we we we'd spoken about this. I mean, you're you're a part of their publicity. They, they specifically the Sinaloa cartel. They really they're really big in, on that. They're really big on on you know putting their name out and saying like we're we're huge. As long as you don't get us in trouble by publishing specifics, right? Yeah, locations, faces, specific names, last names. That kind of stuff, which I don't, I don't care. That's not my job. I mean, I've been asked a lot of times that if it is my responsibility to share this information with authorities, right, to end up with them, and to end them, and, and stuff. It's like, dude, I, I'm not a cop. I'm not in the business of justice. I'm not in the business of arresting people, of sentencing people. I'm not a police. That's not my job. My, my end of things is telling stories, shedding light. The responsibility of the authorities is, okay, we have this information we're going to act against, right? My my part of this business is I, I'll turn on the light on a dark room. I'm not going to take anything. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm just going to turn on the light on this dark room so everybody knows what's in that room. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows what to do with that information, right? Yeah. It's not up for me to tell you or anyone what to do with that info. It's it's up to me to find info that is made to be hidden right yeah we do a damn good job of it really appreciate it man well we got a lot to talk about but you know everybody always gets a gift oh yes you know so uh different gift this time so <clears throat> what happened to the gummy bears man oh don't worry we still have the gummy bears <laughs> but, i love the gummy bears <laughs> no i partnered with laird superfood so you know we you watch a lot of my military type episodes we are very big on mental health and um oh, so yes. so there's a bunch of things on the in there that uh will keep your mind sharp because part of your mental health keeping Dude. keeping uh keeping good mental health is keeping your brain sharp so those are performance mushrooms put that in with your coffee 
Those are a daily green supplement. This is all the stuff you're taking to keep your mind, you know, yes. on check, right? There should be some coffee in there. Those are more of the greens. Oh, yes. There should be some coffee in there that's uh, functional mushroom coffee. That's functional mushroom creamer. Wow, dude. This stuff tastes good. It's the cleanest ingredients you can get. This is, this is, this is cool stuff. Yeah, we partnered with them. My, my wife has been putting me in the superfoods, you know, like yeah. trying to get me more and more into it. And I, it's not that I've been reluctant. It's just that I forget because she has all sort of th like different things. Yeah. But dude, this is great, great stuff. That's to mix it up and oh, work shit, now. Dude, I really appreciate it, man. I You're think welcome. this is, this is definitely going to gonna help a lot my, right to be on the right mindset with all these <laughs> I'll send you some more wow there's plenty of stuff to go around this is cool stuff man I really really appreciate you and Laird, Laird Superfoods Superfood man great stuff thanks Thank a lot alright let's get into the good stuff Luis so look I got a bunch of stuff to talk about here and outlined but I'm just gonna let you kick it off, man. I mean, <laughs> it's been it's been about a year since since uh, since we've met face to face, and yeah. so yeah. what what have you been into? You always have the latest and greatest <laughs> stuff. I've been up, I've been all around, man. Like as I was telling you, I'm trying to do like more big stories instead of like a bunch of little stories. Mm -hmm. And I think, well, I was I guess my last trip, my most recent trip, was to Michoacan. Uh, Central Mexico, great place, great state, great food. It's it's an amazing place uh, all over. Uh, but that's where the uh, self-defense groups were born in 2013, 10 years ago. What self-defense groups? 10 years ago, people, farmers just had it with cartels, right? They were like, dude, we just had it. We have enough money because they are, they are um, avocado and lime exporters. So they're making some really good, good money. And cartels were basically extorting them, kidnapping them to get a piece of that money back in 2013. So this dude, Hippolito Mora, a dude I respect uh, absolutely, man. I have the utmost respect for Hippolito. He was just recently killed and that broke my heart. I had a, I had an interview set up with him and oh, man. he was burned in outside his house, his buddy, when he was still alive. He but, was burned alive. Yeah, dude, that was gruesome shit an uh, avocado farmer yeah dude and and the and the uh and the first who told people let's arm ourselves and go against these fuckers. we can own this shit too and he managed to do that in 2013 he bought a lot of weapons he said like if cartels can get a good dealer you know to traffic weapons for them we can do that too so they brought a lot of weapons from the u.s into michoacan Armed themselves. Are all these weapons all these weapons coming from the U.S.? Most of it, yeah, like probably ninety percent of it. And it's just from local gun stores. Mm -hmm. They just send a shopper in. Yeah, dude. It I mean, sounds like Instacart. Yeah, no, they just send somebody up, and they're like, "Yeah, give me two hundred AR-15s. Give me one hundred and fifty AK-47s. Yeah. Make sure we got plenty of magazines yeah. and ammunition. Grab some cool optics, mm -hmm. and uh, we're gonna need a lot of pistols yeah. too. That, that's literally how it works. Like you, you send out a list to your source or contact in the U.S. He goes shopping around in different gun shows, gun shops everywhere. Takes photos, send you the photos. Hey, this is the kind of like the stuff you're looking at for. You're like, yes. The the uh the revenue you're making out of like trafficking guns, it's more than three times its original price in the US. No kidding. Yeah, so dude. so a pistol that costs thousand dollars or you get it for three, three grand. Thousand easily, cash. So so these guys are making a big buck, you know. Uh, especially when there is war between cartels and government or between rival gangs and stuff. You need a lot of weapons, a lot of ammo, and all this stuff It's coming from the U.S. So it's it's big money for, for a lot of people. Wow. And the border going south, it's pretty much open, right? There's no checkpoints. There's no barriers. There's nothing. I think the border's pretty much open. Oh, both ways. Ways. <laughs> at this point. At this point, you're <laughs> <laughs> it's, really, it's probably even more. There goes more. Luis again. Hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Both ways. <laughs> yeah, dude. Uh, yeah. I think it's probably holding you more coming n n northbound the lines, the long yeah. lines, <laughs> you know, than, than the actual, you know. Yeah, dude. 
So, so, so yeah, these guys order a bunch of guns, a bunch of heavy weapons, ammo and shit, train a lot of people, and they literally close the whole farming sites, the, their cities. They kind of like started setting up barricades. And one morning they decided to go out um, in arms and start killing a lot of cartel members, uh, get, uh, arresting them, turning them over to the, to the authorities, um, engaging in, in fighting after a couple of months. They were out. Are you? Yeah. They, yeah. Won. Yeah, they, they won. They pushed. They successfully yeah. pushed yeah. The, the cartel out. out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it stayed like that for a couple of years until, again, cartels got smarter. Right. What they did is they cartels pushed or lobbied, lobbied. Well, I'm talking like money to, to to the Mexican federal government back then to start going against these guys, calling them terrorists, calling them uh, guerrillas. Uh, calling them illegal f operations, right? Armed civilians, that can be. But cartels, oh yeah, no, they're fine, you know? <laughs> and so they went after these guys. These guys had their own fights with the Mexican government. So they looked probably bad on the public eye because they were now fighting the Mexican government. So the Mexican government came out with a truce. So they were like, all right, we're going to legitimize you. You need a batch. You need a proper shirt, like of some sort of rural civilian force. Uh, but we need you to re to be registered as a self defense member. So they were like, let's let's do that then. So they started registering their, their arms themselves and kind of like going more on the official side of a civilian armed group, but like backed up by the Mexican government. Um, and a lot of these sicarios and narcos and cartel members, they were like handing money to the government saying like, hey man, can I, can you, can I have a patch as well so I can carry my gun and shit? Uh, the first, what, first was one and then 10 and then 100 and then 200 and then 1,000. <clears> and then basically the government legitimized a whole cartel. You know? Whoa. So they, they became self-defense groups, but they were cartel. They were the Viagras cartel. They were the Familia Michoacana cartel. They were all sorts of different cartels wearing shirts and register arms as, as self-defense members. So Hippolito <clears throat> was like, shit, this is not self-defense. This is all cartels. I'm going out. So he stood up himself for several years as a uh, solo vigilante going against cartels. Um, you know, name, naming them, putting out in social media, like these guys are cartel, that guy is operating here, this guy has a laboratory here, calling out for it and saying, hey man, I found a Madam Fetterman laboratory here, come over, raid this, this place. Um, they wouldn't listen, so, so he was all alone, all by himself. And <clears throat> a couple of months ago, he got killed as he was coming back from his farm back home. He, uh, I went to his house and he was building a barricade on on his rooftop. Um, it was it wasn't finished because they to they fight got from. To, yeah, I think he he felt he knew that that at some point he was gonna have to barricade himself on his house and start fighting these guys from from his own you know trench. Uh, <clears throat> but as he was driving back home, he got ambushed and they killed him. And before he was dead, they put his body out and set him on fire in front of everyone to see. There's footage. I also have that video on my on my YouTube. There's footage of his body just in flames. Uh, wow. You know, when people looking around confused and shit. Uh, that was basically to send out a message, right? That you're not you're not gonna stand against us. I mean, we still you're not gonna bring again because the rumors were he was putting again another new group of self defense, you know, of, of good people to fight back against the cartel again. Wow. Uh, but that hope died with him. When I first started this whole podcasting thing, an online store was about as far from my mind as you can get. And now, most of you already know this, but I'm selling Vigilance Elite gummy bears online. We actually have an entire merch collection that's coming soon. And let me tell you, it is so easy because I'm using a platform that is extremely user-friendly and that's Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. What I really like about Shopify is it prompts you all the things that you wanna do with your web store, like connect your social media accounts, write blog posts, just 
have a blog in general. Shopify actually prompts you to do this. You want people to leave reviews under your items? You can do that on Shopify. It's very simple. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to the other leading commerce platforms. Shopify is a global force for millions of entrepreneurs in over 175 countries and power 10% of all e-commerce platforms here in the United States. You can sign up right now for $1 a month, it's shopify.com slash Sean. That's all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash Sean now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash Sean. So nobody else is doing this? This no, didn't spread across the country in Mexico? No, I spoke with his brother, <clears throat> um, and he was absolutely terrified. He was all alone, just at his brother, Hippolito. His brother is called Guadalupe. Brave fucking man, honest man, with big balls. And he's like, dude, if the government is not going to get rid of the Viagras cartel, uh, I'm going to have to go and fight them myself. And, and face probably the same faith as my brother. Um, he lives in a town that is surrounded, dude, surrounded. You can go out of his house and right in front, you will have henchmen sitting on the sidewalk just waiting for him to go out. He can't leave his house. He can't leave his room because he's going to get popped. So he's living there by himself alone in, in the middle of that chaos. Um, so this is brave man. Uh, there is a small community called Tancitaro, which is the world capital of the avocado. Um, that's where all the avocados in the U.S. and probably in the world are coming out of, or most of. Um, huge avocado farms, a lot of money. They still have self-defense groups with, with uh, barricades before you enter the town. Armed people, armed civilians. I interview one of them, and he's like, dude, I'm, I'm a teacher. You know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a teacher at, a, at an elementary school. But uh, on my free time, I come and, and, and guard post on this barricade with my AK and shit, you know, um, waiting for these guys to try to take over our town. That's the last. So the, the people are really starting to try to take matters under their own hands. Yeah. yeah. Because the government is a complete failed state. The, the government, is, it's, it, it's sided with, with the cartels. They've been trying to disarm these guys and not the cartels forever. <laughs> I mean, the last time you were here, you were saying that the government was actually becoming more profitable for the cartel than the yeah. actual drug business. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so now it sounds like they've completely infiltrated it. It's yeah. done. Yeah, yeah. I mean, or de facto government, it's, it's criminal organizations, different cartels on different territories. So it's like we have different governors dependent, depending on which region of, this, of the country you are, uh, and they, they, they rule. They rule. Politicians, they they're just like the representatives, you know, representatives of <clears throat> of the of the law. They're not really in charge, man. Not at all in Mexico. Not at all. That's worrying. Man, you know, with <clears throat> that's um, it's sad, but it's also it's. I mean, good on the people, you know, mm -hmm. for finally saying, "Hey, this is enough." Yeah. We're, we're tired of this, and, and if you aren't going to handle it, then we're going to handle it. And I hope that's, you know, they say courage spreads. It's yeah. contagious. Mm -hmm. And so hopefully that starts to spread a little bit. Yeah, I, There's two directions we could go right now. One, we could go into the drone stuff, or we could go into kind of the new direction of the cartel, which we're going <laughs> to have both. Let's, let's dive in into the drones because I think it's related. That, that's him reaching. Let me lead into it then. So you were talking about this guy, the avocado farmer, right, who built this barricade in his house to fight off the cartel. My first thought was, that, that, 
That's great. I love his mindset. You've been talking about on your social media about these drones last night at dinner. You were talking about these drones. And, um, you know, ISIS started making these drones mm -hmm. quite a while ago. And uh, basically what they're doing is putting explosives on them. Just regular everyday drones, yeah. you know, stuff you can go buy at a hobby store. Yes. You know, attaching explosives on them. And basically it's a, it's a, it becomes a IED. Yeah. Exactly. Improvised explosive device. And so does this guy know that, I mean, before he died, he's building this barricade. All they have to do is just fly a drone over there and boom, yeah. it's done. Yeah. You know? I mean, <clears throat> they got to him before he got to that. But his brother, Guadalupe, he got a, a share of one of those drones like probably a month ago. He was, oh, really? someone started sounding the uh, bells of a local church, apparently calling people out. Apparently, it's gonna, it was going to start a rise up in arms again. So Guadalupe went out, and he was talking to people, and I guess people was, like, coming together, and then the f***ing cartel just dropped a f***ing explosive drone uh, in the middle of that place. Heard a couple of them. Uh, Guadalupe was fine. But that's, that, that, was, that was not happening before when, when Hippolito, his brother, raised up in arms, right? They, the cartels didn't still have the technology to have explosive drones, but now they do. And that's how they're controlling that whole region, by exploding drones all over. They know it's, you can operate that from, from a distance. You have cameras on it. And then they, they use um, plastic, uh, plastic explosives like Tovex. They also use a, a mix of chloride, the, I don't know, this and that. Mm. Um, I, they, they send me the, uh, the exact mix they use and they put a lot of like schnarpel you know uh, shrapnel uh, it's not shrapnel I can't say that word but yeah basically a lot of like nails and, and, and bolts you know, yeah, exactly. pieces of metal to, to make more more damage you know so so that's 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 what they, they're doing right now uh, when I was there my guy in, in Michoacan uh, he's, a, he's a local journalist there and he was taking me to places and we went to look for a priest at a, a local church to, to talk to him because he's part of like, he's an activist himself. So uh, his people told us like, he's not here, he's in the main town, but probably come in the next two hours, he should be here. And I was, we were leaving, they dropped a f uh, um, explosive drone at the same place we were. Like literally, what, two minutes after we left? Oh, wow. We could hear the explosion at the very corner we were parked. This guy was like, we need to move. We stayed at another, at another uh, shitty hotel in the middle of, of nowhere. Uh, and that night, they, one of my sources inside one of these cartels sent me a video of how they were torturing the chief of police of that town. He was like, you want to know who's really in charge? Have a look at this shit. Like 12 in the night, send me that video out and showed me how they were torturing uh, the chief of police of the town. And he's like, we rule this town, man. Uh, so if you want to talk to someone, it's it's us. Uh, and and then in the video they they pop him. They, you can see he's on his knees and then choo, 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 killed him. Out. Mm -hmm. And um, it, Michoacan is crazy, man. That that place is crazy because it's different cartels, like probably five or six different powerful criminal organizations fighting against each other, breaking truce between each other, and then breaking that truce and fighting again and stuff. And you have the cartel Jalisco, you know, the, the Jalisco cartel new generation. Or, Huge there. <clears throat> are CJ. all the cartels using these drones now, or is this one specific? I think all of them are probably using it more, but the guys that are really on top of that game, it's the CJNG, the Jalisco cartel. They, the, those, those are the guys owning that game. Uh, they, they, they have these, it's called Operaciones... Droneros Operaciones Especiales, like special drone operators. They have their own batch, their own, you know, like symbol and thing, which is basically a drone with a school in the center and the CJ and G letters, and then Droneros on, 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 on the lower part, which is drone operators. Wow. Um, so they're, they're putting together a, a special unit to operate drones, you know, and to, and to keep seeing new trends, new drones, um, acquiring new tools, getting explosives, uh, training more guys on, in the use of drones for, for vigilance, but also for, 
for like us IEDs, basically. Yeah, I mean, are they when when it comes to these drones? I mean, are they anti personnel? Are they anti vehicle? Can they take out a building, or can they do? I mean, can they? How how advanced are they with their explosives? For the most part, it's very simple to make an explosive that's anti personnel that's going to take humans out. Yeah, it's a little tougher. You know, when you're looking to take vehicles out, obviously, you know, buildings, yeah. you're talking about packing a lot more explosives. Are they, Yeah. What are the capabilities of these drones? For, for the most part, I would say like probably 70, 80% is uh, what, what you will call fireworks, right? It's mm-hmm. uh, it's just like anti-personal. Um, handmade, handmade explosives out of like their, a different mix of things, you know. Whatever they can get. Yes. Uh, but a good percentage of that shit, it's actual explosive stuff, the real dangerous stuff like like Tovex or C4. They're, they're, oh, they're getting actual yeah, they're, legitimate yeah, exactly. explosives. Mm-hmm. They're not even making their own. No, Where's this coming yeah. from? This is coming from the U.S. The C4 is coming from the U.S. And, and Tovex, which is like the Mexican version of, of C4, or that's, that's kind of like what I understand. Mm-hmm. It's, it's getting from, from Mexico. Um, I know that they still don't have like or to my knowledge, like large amounts of that, because we haven't seen that in a in a widespread use. Uh, for the most part, is that like uh, makeshift explosive things with the drones. But in some cases, they've installed mines with Tobix or C4 that have exploded the armor vehicles, uh, official vehicles of the of the of the Mexican military. If they're, I mean, if they're getting C4, yeah, they're getting from. C4. The U.S. I mean, mm-hmm. where how are they getting it? Would they I have, have no the clue, people man. inside the military. I have no clue, but I have a, a source inside the Mexican military, and he was he was the, I was having an argument with them because it was like they're not getting C four, and I'm like, dude, they. I know for a fact. I went there. I you saw. I, it. I saw it, Do you and have they video? told me, and they. I I, I, I sent you a video. I, I don't think that C four. What 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 I sent you that video where they're putting up the uh, the drones and the explosives, but on the same on the same setting in the same place they had. Tovex and T4, not large amounts. But I was telling this guy, I, I've seen it myself, and he was like, we don't have any intel as of they're getting C4. That's extremely hard to get. And then like probably a month after, in the in, in, in a, a small place in Chihuahua called uh, Palomas, Puerto Palomas, border town, the Mexican authorities, the Mexican customs, seized a somewhat large amount of C4 sneaking from the U.S. towards Mexico on, on an American citizen. That was an American citizen. South. So, so, and I, I send the the news uh, article to these guys. Like, dude, you see what I'm talking about? They are getting their hands on on C4, and he's like, oh shit, yes, you're right, you're absolutely right. Wow, it's, what are they using these for? Are they, I mean, who are they targeting? Are they using this for cart like cartel wars? Are they using it on civilians? They usually they're using it for both for. I've only seen they using this heavy stuff against armored vehicles from government and from uh, cartel, what they call the monstros, these makeshift armor rhino type vehicles that they make, you know. And they it's it, they're absolutely armored to, to the to the engine doors, everything, and it's all makeshift, you know. Um, and they're extremely hard to take out because of the they even armor the, the tires, you know, and stuff. Uh, but that's what they're using these explosives for. Because only <clears throat> one of these one of these vehicles pass over a load of C4 and they detonate that shit. That'll 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 damage the, the armor vehicle. Oh, yeah. And they've used it against the the official armored military vehicles. And it's working. And it's working, yes, yes. Do you have any video of that? I think there is, uh, I don't think it's video, but I think there, there, is, there are photos okay. published online. I'll, I'll, I'll look for them and, and send it right over. Are they using this on U.S. Border Patrol at all? No, for the most part, on the border, what they're using drones for, it's for vigilance of the movement of the Border Patrol and U.S. authorities. They're, they, they do have specific bases to watch over the, the U.S. movements. Uh, also... I wrote a story, another thing I was recently into is they have what they call, <clears throat> it's called C, I can't remember the name, what they call it, but it's basically vigilant bases they establish in different border towns where they have 
they set up different video cameras all over the city, you know. Uh, they asked permission probably from an old lady in a house. Hey, can we put just the security camera so you're safe and whatever? We're just going to install it here. So they have a lot of those, those a lot of like eye rings um, on, on different places that they can keep, you know, watching over. They have... Uh, like just regular ring camera type stuff? Regular stuff, stuff that they get from Amazon. And then they have this center of intelligence where they have a bunch of of cameras, a bunch of, you know, screens. Um, screens, and they're getting information through WhatsApp and handing over information either for rivals or uh, Mexican officials, U.S. authorities around the border. If they want to place a hit, they're like, hey, this guy's driving a, I don't know, black SUV with these plates. And they'll just start watching the cameras all around town and say like, okay, this guy's driving that way, so you can get that guy on the next street up. And so it's it's like a proper proper established intelligence center. Wow. Have yeah, you been in one? I have a bunch of photos. I'll send you photos of these places from inside these places. Uh, it's, oh, it's, man. Yeah, it's it's crazy because they're, they're... These guys are more sophisticated than on the government. Yeah, man. They're, they're getting to that level. I mean, I, I know that they're still, they're still at law, so that limits their power. But as they keep, you know, Leveling going up, up. the ladder... Uh, in, in corruption and getting more permission and more access to government stuff, uh, they're getting more sophisticated and, and more established. How are they... <clears throat> what are the range of these drones? Do you have any idea? I, I, ha I have no clue. I think it, it really varies because these are all commercial drones they get from Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, for the most part, are DJI drones. What's, What's the most weight that you've seen one hold? They had this Maverick, Maverick, I can't remember the the exact model of that, but it was, it was a somewhat big Maverick drone. It was it was meant to carry uh, a D DSLR camera. Okay. So, you know, with, with, with extra batteries and probably a microphone. So that's, that's probably the most. Uh, okay, yeah. so maybe couple pounds. Yes, and, and, and I remember they were uh, loading that one up with a box, with a plastic box with a bunch of stuff in. Yeah. Um, well, how are they detonating the explosives? By impact. So they, they just impact the drone against a house or a person, vehicle. Well, there has to be more than that, especially if they're using C4, because C4 can only be detonated with a with a with a with a charge. It's so like, basically, to detonate C four, you could set C four on fire. It's not going to do anything but mm -hmm. burn. You could throw C four at a house. It's not going to do anything. Oh yeah, you could like, play kickball with it. It's not going to do anything. But if you if you prime it with a blasting cap, mm -hmm. that when that blasting cap explodes, then it detonates then, the C four. So it has. I to have be. no clue, man. I mean, I know that for the most part, the makeshift drones with a makeshift explosive. I was telling you with, with the. Yeah, that's ba basically by impact. They, it's they, okay. Yeah, but all the other stuff, like when they hit the Renos and and that kind of stuff, I have no clue how they're detonating that stuff. That would be interesting to find out. You yeah. know, it's a relatively, I would think it would be a relatively easy defense against the drones. I mean, you can get these commercial jammers, mm -hmm. you know, and just. And jam the frequency that the drone runs off of. I mean, and you can get these for relatively cheap yeah. on uh, just, you can Google it. I mean, they're illegal, mm -hmm. but, you know, you can buy them. Yeah. <laughs> They'll ship them to you from China. The Mexican government has been afraid of using those jammers because they know that drones have um, explosive charge on them. So they don't want the drone probably, they will have probably have to coordinate where it's gonna, it's gonna fall or something. Yeah. I mean, the caveat to that would be, you know, your cell phone, everything, e every signal's gonna be jammed. You yeah. Know what I mean, so you're you're out there, but that would be. Because if think. it falls, it's gonna. Yeah, I mean, if they could figure out the frequency that the drone is running off of, which should, I mean, it's probably in the user manual. Mm. You know what I mean? You probably just Google it or look it up and see. What so you take over running. control of the of the drone and not necessarily just drop it. Well, it would drop. It will drop. That's well, it won't, it, if it, if you can get the bubble big enough to where it's jamming this, it's not going to drop on you. Mm -hmm. 
but probably on a because the, the, the fear what they told me when I interviewed these these state police in Michoacan they they do have these weird looking guns that are apparently signal jammers and I asked them like where why they're not using that stuff and they're like if we if we shoot a drone down it's gonna fall probably on on a house on a civilian yeah. and it's gonna cost you know well guess what it's gonna fall somewhere somewhere <laughs> <laughs> so whether the car the yeah. cartel makes it fall or whether the jammer makes yes. it fall, but um, yeah, it would be an. I mean, they're 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 actually developing. They have them. Um, mm -hmm. I've been actually talking with the owner of one of these companies. They're they're making energy weapons that they don't take ammunition. They don't take anything, but they'll disable a drone like that, and you just you could watch fifty of them all fall out of the sky at the Whoa. same time. There's no sound, nothing. It's just. That's pretty much interesting, yeah. uh, and that's probably helpful in in Mexico because they're getting they're getting big on on technology, all sorts of technology. You know, moving into some other stuff, let's talk about it, it's it's interesting how their weapons continue to develop and 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 how resourceful you know they are mm -hmm. uh, is fascinating to me. But you know what else is fascinating is is I've been reading that some of these cartels, I don't know if moving away is the right sense. I'd kind of mentioned this earlier, I think, but it seems like they're kind of, they're definitely expanding out of the drug market. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that's not even the majority of their income at this point in time yeah. now. I mean, I know, I know there's a lot of human trafficking happening, gun smuggling, drugs but it sounds like the cartels are becoming so sophisticated and becoming so powerful that they're actually taking over a legitimate business yeah. and commerce do you yeah. want to yeah sure on that i think one the, the main reason for a criminal organization to exist is is money right it's revenue they want to have more money and more power and wherever they have a sense that there is money in whichever industry that is, legal or illegal, they're gonna try to bank on it. At some point, drugs were the most profitable revenue, right? Because they were illegal, hard to get, scarce, and there was a huge demand in the US. Right now, the price of cocaine is plummeting. It's probably at its lowest in history. It's You, you can get a brick of cocaine for 16 grand, right? Like it's already in the US, which is absolutely, ridiculous amount of, of, of a price mm -hmm. they're still moving what was it that it's at the 30 high? even even a, even a low price will be 30 35 40 a low price will be price 30 thousand mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay yeah. um so it's like a fire sale with cocaine right yeah now. exactly like everybody's like uh, uh, every everybody in the u.s is getting a hold of a <laughs> couple of bricks of cocaine and then trying to split you know that over and so get some revenue they're still making money out of out of drugs, uh, but the thing is, that's sort of like a established revenue stream now, right? They manage to have that that streamline of revenue established, no issue, no problem. They can even sort of like calculate how much money they're gonna make over a year of shipping different kinds of drugs and stuff. So that's basically settled for them for the, for their business. What they're seeing there is an opportunity is in natural resources. And human smuggling, and 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 of course uh, the, the the political power, capitalization of, of political power, you know, political positions. That's where they're they're now not moving away from drugs, but probably saying, you know what, we have established drug routes, we have established revenue, we have established uh, providers and clients. Now that that's established and it's getting to a established level of money, and it's not even that high anymore. There's no word left to even expand in the drug market. Exactly, we we basically own it, and that's it, because they they find new new clients, right? Like Europe and then Africa and stuff. But it's, it has a cap, you know. And then they move from that to other revenue streams. One of them being uh, mining. First, they started embedding with mine international mining companies to bring security. Even if those mining companies I've reached out to, they say they have no clue. They don't do that kind of like deals with cartels. 
and they disguise everything as going with private security companies. Well, guess what private security companies they, they are, right? They're, they are cartels. So they pay these private security companies uh, first to lobby with Mexican security forces to assure that their operation in certain region, it's going to be secure, right? They're like, oh, we're too afraid of cartels and we want to explode this mine of, I don't know, lithium, um, gold, silver, whatever. But we want to know we're safe. They're smart enough and they do have people doing research enough to know that that region is highly controlled by the cartel. So they will just see it and negotiate through different security companies, right? Um, that means that the security company says, okay, usually we charge, let's call it $1,000 for a deal like that. But now we're going to charge $3,000, three times more, because we're going to split that with a cartel, and then you'll be safe. So the cartel basically owns the security around most of these mining companies uh, on, on different natural resources, right? That was first at the beginning. Then cartels started like stepping up, a step ahead, putting a step ahead and saying like, oh, you know what? It looks like we have rumors that th here could be a lot of new silver unexploded yet. Why don't we establish right there and, and hold that place for a while? So when a mining company comes and say like, hey, want to explode that place? We're already here, man. Yeah, you're going to have to, you know, give us the good money to keep you safe, to get rid of all these people and, and we're good. And and that's been that's been going on and on in different places. So when when we see cartels fighting, like in places like Zacatecas, Puebla, all that stuff, the government tells us, "Oh, they're fighting a drug route." And it's like, dude, that is that is not even a fucking drug route. There there is no port, there is no main highway that leads to the U.S. Whatever, not the only one. That's not a production site. But what you have is a lot of silver like in Zacatecas. So these guys want to own that place because they know there's going to be a new project coming in town and that's big money for them, big money. That's all they're fighting for. In Chiapas, Cartel Jalisco versus Sinaloa Cartel fighting hard, killing a lot of innocent people, making a mess, making parades. Like you will see parades of cartels going and the people will be like, hey, save us please from the other cartel, whatever. Chiapas, the the major and main uh, human trafficking border and human smuggling border right now there is in in all of the Americas. That's that's where the uh, bottleneck is. That's the new U.S. border. The, the 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 U.S. basically moved its border to southern Mexico. That, mm -hmm. that, that they negotiated that with the Mexican government. You just put up a bunch of military in your southern border so they don't reach or southern border, right? which is, it's not working, but still, they're paying Mexico to do that. Hmm. And when, while Mexico's trying to do that... What's it look like down there? Dude, it's a it? mess, man. Is it a, I mean, is there any... Is there a line? There's a river, and there's a bridge, and there's these little, small booth of security. There's a bunch of military. It's a total joke. Dude, it's a joke. People are literally walking across the river with merchandise, even. They, they go in, in Guatemala buy cheap stuff, you know, like clothes or toys for their kids, whatever. They just I mean, walk it's, over. it sounds like it is so bad. And we're going to get to this with, with the, with the lobbying of the government from the cartels and the government or the cartels embedding within the government. I mean, you were talking about this the last time. So essentially it is, I mean, it, it's so foolish. I mean, so the U S the government has embedded so much in the Mexican government that the U.S., this is actually the exact same thing as the U.S. paying the cartel to, they're paying the cartel to police their own. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's to, just, I mean, it's it's absurd. It's, re, yeah. Remember the last time I told you that I knew that a cell from Sinaloa cartel was moving down to to Chiapas because they were uh, moved specifically to stop the, fl the influx of migrants, right? Wh who's paying for that? Who lobbied that shit? That was the U.S. government. That was the U.S. government through the Mexican government towards the cartel. So it's basically this. 
U.S. government says to Mexico, hey, man, loud enough so the cartels hear. I need you to secure your southern border. I'll give you something in exchange, but I need you to secure that border, right? Mexican government says, yes, but it's going to cost you this much. And they're like, we'll fund you all the money you need. Hand, hand the money over. Probably Mexican government keeps 20%, 80% goes for the cartel. So like, hey, guys, go and do your thing on the southern border. Yeah. Cartel gets that, there. Because the Mexican government is the cartel. Exactly. And, 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 and the cartel gets to the southern border and at the beginning start doing their job. Like, nobody's going to cross if we don't know. And then they start taking more money. I mean, he's like, if the Mexican government already paid, why don't we get some extra cash from these guys as well? Mm -hmm. so, so they're like, yeah, come on over, just pay us. They becoming more and more and more powerful. And the U.S. government is like, Mexico, what the f You're letting everybody through. Where's the money we gave you? It's in the cartel hands. So that's, that's what's happening. Like these guys are trying to monopolize every other aspect of our regular lives. Like in Michoacan, the avocados, every Super Bowl season, dude, it's bad stuff for Michoacan. Every Super Bowl season, the amount of avocado <laughs> that it's consuming the U.S. spikes the shit out of prices in Mexico. And cartels are, let's go for those avocados. They, let's put a cap on the production of avocados. Even if they go to shit, even if they go to waste, even if they get rotten in a warehouse, we don't give a shit, man. They're controlling the supply. We're controlling the supply, so they control the price. Same thing with, with, with lemon. They've, they just recently, like last month, they killed a bunch of farmers, let poor lemon farmers that decided, you know what? you i have my own lemon trees i'm gonna i'm gonna sell that shit i need that for my family they're like i told you no more picking up lemons because we need the prices to spike so, so they're gonna sell. control the supply make lemons and avocados very rare to inflate the pro this is what the de beers family did to the diamonds yeah exactly that's exactly what they're doing that that's exactly what they're doing with everything with everything they started doing that with avocados and lemons and you go to a, to a corner store here in the U.S., they're like, what the f***? This avocado is extremely expensive now. It's, it's not because of supply and demand and the market, whatever. It's because of cartels taking over the, the production or the picking up of, of, of their fruits. Wow. And it's, and it's crazy. And then I was also in Chihuahua, northern Mexico, the state uh, where Ciudad Juarez is, just right across El Paso. So it's a huge state. And I was deep into the mountains in what we call La Sierra de Chihuahua, which is the, the little the mountains of Chihuahua, a region controlled absolutely by the Sinaloa cartel, by a faction anyways of, of it, uh, to learn how they're monopolizing water. Water did. Like, we were, I, I was there during a, during, a, during a drought, right? One of the worst that ever hit northern Mexico. Water was absolutely scarce. The government was telling us, you know, you need to take uh, control of the water usage because we're out of water. And, 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 and also, the rivers that flow from the mountains down to the Rio Grande, down to the, to the river that divide both countries, Mexico and the U.S. have an agreement of sharing waters, right? Uh, the, 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 the Rio Grande is born in the Colorado Mountains. Okay. Then it goes into Mexico and then back into the U.S. and then back into Mexico up in Coahuila and then back in the U.S. in Texas and like that. So they have an agreement. You, you let that water flow and I'll give you 20% back and then up, up ahead you give me 20% back of that water that crossed into your turf and that's an agreement, right? We're at a point where the U.S. and Mexico relationship is very fractured because of water. The U.S. is saying Mexico owes us like five years of water they haven't paid and mexico is like we are on a draft we don't have enough water to pay you back and we need that water for our locals cartels learned about this shit they say like oh so water is cars now so water is money now so we want to control every river creek lake in this region at least in the region we own and they start doing that in in, in chihuahua in in this in the sierra de chihuahua and how they start doing that is literally putting lookouts, uh, sicarios and henchmen around those creeks where the creeks were born or where the, where the rivers were born. Uh, there is so a they're looking for natural springs. Natural springs. Natural springs, yes. There is a huge lake called uh, Lago de Arareco, a beautiful lake in the, in the middle of the, of, the, of the mountains of the hills in, in Chihuahua. 
The last time I was there, dude, I mean, it was probably only full to the third part of it. Absolutely empty. And when I asked locals, that no one wants to, wants to say what exactly was happening to the Arareco River, right? To the Arareco Lake. The, that lake doesn't have an exit. You know, it, it doesn't it doesn't have a stream of the, the water is going to through that river or through that whatever. The water stays there. It's a natural lake that fills every time it rains. So the locals had this joke and they were telling me, like, I think it has a hole on the on the right bottom of the of the lake, and that's where that water is going. Because every morning, um, we see the lake; it's more empty. You go to sleep one night, and the next morning, it's more empty. And I was like, they're trying to tell me something they don't they can't say, right? Mm -hmm. So I started working my way in with locals and with biologists and people around. And they show me how the cartels by night goes with uh, every night goes to that creek to that to that lake with these water pipes and start extracting a lot of water from from it, and then they sell that water to hotels, stores, Airbnbs for tourists. You go to a hotel in the middle of a draft of a draft, and 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 you can open the the faucet and leave it open for hours, and you're not gonna run out of water. But if you're in a local house, you're immediately going to be out of water, like probably within an hour of leaving the faucet open. Um, and all these guys are sourcing from the cartel, and the cartels are making shit tons of money. So they are now controlling, is this, they're controlling the water supplies? Water supplies, yeah. Is this spreading? It, I, don't, I don't have, I still have no information about other states. I did my reporting specifically in Chihuahua because it was going through the worst draft in history in Mexico. That was the that was where water became more and more scarce. I think it's happening also in Nuevo Leon, uh, in, in the also border with Texas in, in Monterrey, Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, all those places, uh, east of Mexico. It's not, it, the, it, the northern east of Mexico. Because um, also water is absolutely scarce right there. So so they're banking on that. They're banking on jellyfish in Sonora. Jellyfish. Jellyfish. <laughs> Jellyfish is just like that's 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 very new. That's that's a very re new revenue stream they they just popped up in Sonora in the Mar de Cortes, which is the the um, Pacific side of Mexico. Uh, there is a massive population of jellyfish. We don't use jellyfish for anything, so it's became basically a plague in Mexico. Mm -hmm. But in China, apparently, dehydrated and covered or curated with salt, it's an exquisite plate. It's something expensive they, they eat. It's a delicacy. Yes, exactly. They, they, they pay shit tons for, for, for a jellyfish dehydrated and, 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 and curated with salt. Uh, Sinaloa cartel, well, that, that's been happening before the Sinaloa cartel. Local fishermen uh, have their season. They'll grab a bunch of jellyfish and sell that out to to the um, to the Vietnam and it's Vietnam and other Thailand Asian, Thailand governments yes both, both of them they're, they're selling that to the, to the to those governments and then they are selling it to the Chinese government and making a buck out of it great season for local fishermen uh, the, the the jellyfish season when the cartel land uh, learned how much money they were making it was something like Ten million dollars a season, or something like that. The the revenue from that, they were like, "All right, so you're not gonna sell anymore directly to these companies. You're gonna sell to us, and we're gonna sell to the companies. Uh, we're gonna ex export this shit." Um, many fishermen decided, like, you know what? No, I don't think that's a good idea, man. I mean, we're gonna be left out of this business, and we're gonna just be left with you know just a couple of bucks around. So they didn't listen. They killed two, three fishermen, and then they started burning the, 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 the trucks where they were transporting the jellyfish and, and killing some of, the, some of the drivers to make a point. It's like, okay, you keep selling directly to these guys, and I'm going to keep killing you guys. Um, so now they own that business. Now the fishermen had to ask for permission first to go out and sell and, 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 and get jellyfish, and then they have to report exactly how many jellyfish they gathered and they sell them. They sell that to them for 
you know, super cheap price, local price. And now the cartel is handling with Vietnam and Thailand uh, companies to export that shit out to China. So, so they're literally getting in the middle of, of a lot of heavy revenue business, you know, businesses. Wow. Yeah. They're, you had mentioned something about Lyft and Uber as well. Oh, yes, that's another thing. There is an app. If you don't mind, let me let me let me tell you which which app is this. I don't know. If, do you think that's 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 fine? We're fine. If we say the, the brand. We're gonna get in trouble. It's up to you. I mean, I'm I'm not gonna get in trouble, but I don't know if you want to call out the brand. They probably don't even know. But let me uh let me see. Well, there there is one of these um. Uh, ride applications like Uber and Lyft, specifically in Culiacán, in the, the main city, capital city in Sinaloa. Um, I can't find it. Uh, but this is an international brand as well. Some the the, the next top competitor to Lyft and, and Uber, and they establish um, business in, in Culiacán, in, in Sinaloa, and in several different parts of Mexico as well. But in Culiacán, there was an order by allegedly Los Chapitos, the, the sons of El Chapo Guzman uh, of the Sinaloa cartel, to, to, for everyone to stop working for Uber and Lyft and to start working with that company exclusively. So there was a time where, the, very recently, where, where you will see the, the local news in Sinaloa, there was a lot of Uber and Lyft drivers getting killed. And everybody started wondering why. I asked one of my sources that what, what's happening, and he told me, like, there is an order for every Uber driver, Lyft driver to stop working there and start working with these companies specifically. I still don't know why he, he couldn't really give gave me an answer. He's like, that, that was the order. And I was like, do they have money in that company? Uh, do they pay something? Or what's, what's the deal? Is so it like, their company? I don't think it's their company because it's an international company. You know, this is, I think it's a US-based company or, yeah, it's it's like Uber and Lyft. Interesting. Like, yeah. yeah I'll, fi- I'll find the name of the company. And, uh, what? When did that start happening? Probably like two months ago. Like, so they're they're getting involved in legitimate transportation. Yeah. Water. Water. The water supply. Yeah. The food supply. Human smuggling. Human smuggling. Drugs. Yeah. Fishing. Well, yeah, food supply. Food supply. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have their hands on on everything, man, and at. Um, and again, what they what the, their strategy is, when they feel there is an opportunity to be to be making money out of an industry, they'll dive in. They'll dive in. It's it's they're probably the the, the who's engineering these ideas. That's the thing, dude. I I, I it's weird because when I was talking to these higher up in the Sinaloa cartel, one of the guys that that it's in the leadership of the Sinaloa cartel. They're smart people. They went to schools in Europe, in Canada, in the U.S. You know, this is highly educated people. So These are that. serious business people. Yes, and and they know and they have friends with money that probably give give them ideas. You know, like hey, I mean, why? they're probably. Not probably. I mean, if they're hiring these kind of people, they're doing a straight market assessment. You know, <laughs> yeah. This is what the avocado industry brings in every year. We need to take a piece yeah. of this or the whole thing. This is, you know, this is what the water treatment plants and mm-hmm. the in 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 the water supply businesses are making. This yeah. is. I think if I you mean, think that, about like uh, of of like an investment house, they they have two things. They have analysts. They kind of like look at the trends and they have people on the ground, you know, uh, pitching in new ideas saying like, hey, man, I just learned that water is going to be scarce in this state for the rest of the year, you know, because there's a draft and there's not enough water and Mexico needs to pay water to the U.S., that kind of stuff. And I think cartel has both. They have like analysts saying like how much and how is the market of different things moving and people on the ground saying, hey, there is no water in, in Chihuahua. Are they? Are you aware? Are they? Are they webbing out in anything else? That's that's as far as I'm aware now. You know, these these past couple of years, I've been reporting on all sorts of different stuff they're doing. You know, traveling from Chihuahua to Michoacan to Chiapas, uh, yeah, to Sinaloa to different different places, and it's wild, man. Yeah, I mean, what. <laughs> How does this? How do you even? 
How do you even begin to combat this when they are illegitimately legitimizing themselves into 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 just everyday regular business? Yeah. I mean, it's a crime to. I mean, it's. How do I say this? I mean, they're f forcing these businesses to comply with them, but once they're complying, I mean, the crime just goes into the past. And, and yeah. I mean, how? You it seems what? like it would be impossible to break them up. At yes, this point. I mean, we're we're definitely past that point now because I think there was still there was still a time where where a business owner, a politician could have closed the door for that, you know, mm -hmm. and say, you know what? I don't care if I'm going to make three times more money. It's dirty money. I'm not going to do it. I'm yeah. not going to comply with you. I'm not going to do it. They were, they were not still that powerful back then. There were still like cartels. I don't, I don't even call them cartels anymore. They're either criminal enterprises or pseudo paramilitary armies, you know. Yeah. They're they're everything but drug cartels. I think that's a term that it's absolutely outdated. We we shouldn't be calling them drug cartels because they're not drug cartels. I mean what is what I mean what does this mean for Mexico? What does I, it look like? Do it ten years from now. It's 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 looking bad. It's looking sad. Like imagine on your daily basis, you're a regular man living in Mexico, middle class. You say, you know what? Uh, I, I probably can put together some money, some savings to make a business. It depends on where you are. You're gonna get extorted or kidnapped immediately to get you to, to rip you up of what you're building. If you pass through that. You're going to learn that you're going to have to make decisions and say, like, if I'm going to make a business in Mexico, if it's, I don't know, whatever you're doing, you're setting up ladders for whatever, or building houses. If you're making enough money, someone's going to come after you. Someone's going to say, hey, man, why don't we partner and you start laundering money for us and I'll keep you protection. And you say, no, man, I'm not interested. I'm, I'm doing my money. And then they start extorting you or, or kidnapping your family. And they're like, hey, what about now? And you'll be like, I'd rather close my business or comply and make a buck out of it. Mm -hmm. But now you're part of it. I mean, it's it's just getting to the point where even if somebody wants to start a legitimate business, it's so, I mean, you can't get in the avocado business, you can't get in the lemon business, you can't get in the jellyfish business, you can't get in the transportation business, you cannot get into the water business. You can, can't you, dabble in the drug business. Can't. Yeah, I mean, it's just. What does that make for uh, for for the economy of our country? You know, that's kind of what I'm getting at. Mm -hmm. Is I mean, you know, what's left? Power. They'll probably go after the power. The, they're know? on. Yeah, they're control on, that exactly. Medicine, the medical industry. They're on that. I mean, it's it's. They're on everything. They're on everything. It's a fucking plague. I mean, the thing is, they're gonna start shrinking the middle class so much that there will be no develop, economic development in Mexico for a good while. Yeah. And it's probably, we're probably facing that. I'm not, I, I mean, I'm, I'm of course very ignorant on how the financial markets move or whatever. But if you think of it, if the, if the uh, middle class is absolutely shrinked and all you have left is probably an upper class and then a lower, lower class, right? And, and, and the cartel is kind of like monopolizing and going in between both, then a lot of the money you need for that country, for that middle class to leave, it's going to come through illegal sources, right? Mm -hmm. the, these uh, study by science, this new research by the Science Magazine said that Mexico, that the cartels are the fifth largest employers in Mexico, right below the Mexican government. Wow. Fifth largest employer of, in Mexico. So if the Mexican government will go after cartel activity and stop all the money moving from related to any criminal organization, we will become like poor immediately, man. We will become like one of the most poor countries in America, you know, in, 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 in the, the continent, world. probably in the world, man. Because this money is getting through everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mexico is a highly cash-based country. You use a lot of cash. There's a lot of different stores, corner stores, different places that they don't want to pay taxes because they're going to get 
left without anything, so they use cash. Perfect for money laundering. But also, where is this cash getting from? You don't go to an ATM and withdraw money all the time. There's cash moving around the, the, the city, you know. They, you yeah. can pay with cash. And it's, it's, it's dirty money. It's cartel money. But that's the money that is backing up Mexico right now. Man. So I guess Mexico needs to find a way to legitimize all that dirty money, all that, you know, money made with dirty hands, put it into a legal, basically launder money for these guys, and then stop the revenue and, and opening up more, I don't know, man, shops or whatever. But do you have any ideas on how to even begin to combat something like that? I think a good start, it's, it's again, by the Mexican government recognizing we have an issue, we have a problem. But putting a blind eye, it's not helping. Saying I, mean, everyone, would, I mean, where would they even start, though? I guess if you start saying, openly saying, we have a war, a non-declared war in Mexico that we're losing, you can, you can get resources, you can get people, you can get smart people jumping in, you know, making education policies, health policies, financial plans to know how to get out of it how to can fight these guys not only just going after them and shooting them and you know yeah but actually how do we hurt these guys how do we take the money and the power out of these guys one strategy that ha that has worked in the past is divide and conquer and you make a bunch of little cartels and then you go fight them but that's you're only gonna gonna fight the armed branches of the cartels right what about the financial branches so you're talking about proper using propaganda propaganda against dude. the cartels you need to switch and change the you're way you're smart you're a smart dude we, yeah dude like that's how they're that's getting genius. into everywhere right by propaganda so we would have to so you turn it into a psyop yeah that's I, I I think that's the only way to go out at this point, you know, of of that. That's a very interesting conversation. Let's take a break. Let's. And we'll come back. We'll, maybe we'll pick up right there. For sure. Next on the Sean Ryan Show. We embedded with a girl, with a woman. Uh, she's the mother of five kids. She lost her job during the pandemic. And a friend of her at a bar came out like, "Hey, dude, I know a couple of guys that will give you a car, a nice car." and they'll give you five grand every time you cross. The cartel guys that were stashing her car, they, they told me the first five, six times, we send her across without anything. She, th she thought she had anything, but we're doing that to test her first, and also to get the custom officers used to her crossing every other day, once a week, every weekend. So we did that several rounds. And then after the sixth, well, we loaded the, 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 the gas tank packed with fentanyl pills. Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.